can. We you about ready? We'll... Have you gotten the sign? Is Elaine giving you the signal? Yes, I have a signal from okay. Linda. Let's go. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Let us begin this last evening of our deliberations with a prayer of thanks. I was thinking at least I'm thankful to get this far. <laughs> so is David, so is the panel. Lord, we thank thee for this place in which we dwell, for the love that unites us, for the peace accorded us this day, for the hope with which we expect tomorrow, for health, for work, for food, for the bright skies that make our lives delightful, for our friends in all parts of the earth, for our guests at these tables. Keep them in your care and strengthen them in your service. Amen. I call upon the president of the college, Dr. John Kendall. One of the special advantages that I have as a person involved in these annual conferences is that I often have a chance to speak uh, individually with our participants and uh, learn a bit about their, their fields. Uh, more often than not, uh, they represent a field about which I know very little. Uh, this has been especially true, I think, in the uh, uh, conference this time. Uh, uh, Professor Leonhuvud has been uh, instructing me for the last few minutes on the distinction between thin markets and thin market, or thick markets and thin markets, and I think I have some sense of, of that now. Uh, I. Um, uh, I know only one very brief story that, that even remotely applies to the field of economics it has to do with a graduate, an alumnus of a college similar to this who had been voted the person least likely to succeed in his class. And uh, he returned on his 25th anniversary uh, to uh, step out of his uh, silver cloud, uh, his wife draped in mink and sable and diamonds uh, in great evidence. Uh, his friends from his class were amazed. Uh, they said, Joe, uh, we, we don't understand this. You really didn't show much promise in college. And uh, how, how have you done this? And he said, well, it's really very simple. He said, I, I invented a little device and I was able to produce it for a dollar I sold it for five dollars, and believe me, I'm here to tell you that if you can make five percent on your money, you're going to be in good shape. <laughs> so much for my uh, economics lecture. We'll move on to the next uh, thing. Um, it's always difficult to know uh, who uh, whom one should introduce at an evening such as this. The panelists will be introduced in a bit. Uh, many of you here have, have heard them and met them earlier in these two days. There are just two people that I would like to recognize this evening, people that play a very important role in the life of this college. Uh, the chairman of our board of trustees, Clyde Allen, and his wife, Lois, I would like to acknowledge them. And the uh, Bishop of the Minnesota Synod of the Lutheran Church in America, with which this college is affiliated, Bishop Herbert Chilstrom. <laughs> During the past two days, as we have considered the legacy of John Maynard Keynes, some of the panelists have uh, on occasion expressed a concern that they might be repeating themselves, and I feel that way this evening. 
I made similar comments to the ones I'm about to make at the opening, but because many of you were not there, I would like to uh, say essentially the same things again. Each time as we gather for another Nobel conference, uh, those of us here at Gustavus are thankful and appreciative for a number of things. For the fact that uh, nearly 24 years ago, a group of Nobel laureates, the president of this college at that time, Edgar Carlson and others, had an idea. This idea was to have a conference on a topic of significance and general interest, invite the very best scholars that we could bring to the campus and have them join in a conversation and allow us to listen and participate. We are also thankful in a special way for the commitment and interest of Russell Lund and his family who have provided the endowment that gives the ongoing uh, support that makes this conference uh, possible. We appreciate in a very special way the relationship which we have through this conference and as a college with the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm and a relationship that extends to a very personal level with our relationship with the current president of that foundation, uh, Baron Stieg Rommel, who has been one of our participants in this uh, panel this year. We are also thankful, of course, to those who make it possible for us to do this in specific ways. The panelists who travel, in some cases, great distances, in one case all the way from Hayward, Wisconsin, uh, where uh, Professor Tobin uh, has his summer uh, cabin, uh, others from overseas, uh, to uh, share with us their thoughts and ideas to our staff, to our faculty, all who make it possible. So we thank you, uh, all of you, those of you who are our guests this evening, for coming. At this point, I would like to uh, turn the lectern over briefly uh, to the Council General of Sweden, located in Minneapolis, Carl Eric Andersen, for a greeting. Carl Eric. President Kendall, scholars, friends, and students of Gustavus. My wife and I are happy to attend the prestigious Nobel Conference for the fifth consecutive year. That Baron Stig Grammel, the president of the Nobel Foundation, is among the distinguished lecturers, gives this conference an added dividend. Now, may I? mention um, an example of the new economic thinking in practice and on the ground floor level, so to say. According to Wall Street Journal, the kids in early grades now have to learn that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts until you add the finance charges. That is, uh, in practice, the economist would be. <coughs> the ties that uh, have bound Gustavus in Sweden, since uh, this college was founded in 1862, have become increasingly stronger through the years. This is emphasized by the Alfred Nobel Hall of Science, the Folke Bernadot Memorial Library and the Josip Bjørn Concert Hall, having been named after famous Swedes who have distinguished themselves in various fields. They are further underlined by the most recent development of the Linnaeus Arboretum. These ties will be manifested when the college opens its 125th anniversary celebration on February the 2nd, 1987, with a concert by the Gustavus Choir at the Royal Dramatic Theater in Stockholm, Sweden. Now, the, the historic links between Sweden and the United States dates not only to 1783 when a treaty of friendship and trade was signed, 
But also further back to 1638, when the first Swedish settlement took place in Delaware. Plans are now developing in Sweden and in the United States for a grand celebration in 1988 of 350 years of Swedish presence in the United States. Other ties are through the student exchange programs. Last year, eight students from Sweden were enrolled here, and this year there are nine. I'm happy to say that these nine students are present this evening and are seated together over at the two tables there. Now at their table they have Anne Swanson, who was the uh, Svenskarnas Dogs Midsummer Queen this year. And Anne is a sophomore at Gustavus. Anne represented the state of Minnesota in Sweden at the various Swedish-American celebrations which always take place during the summer month over there. And especially as representative of Minnesota at the Minnesota Day in Växjö, in Kronoberg in Småland, a county from where so many people left to find their way to this great state, Minnesota. I would like to say to all students, whether you come from foreign countries or various parts of the United States, that the Nobel Conference presents a unique educational experience. It will be an important event in your book of memories to relate later to family and friends. My warm congratulations on the success of the 22nd Annual Nobel Conference. Thank you. You're next. Thank you, Carl, Eric, uh, for that uh, cordial greeting. I now call upon Professor Lawrence Owen in the Department of English here at Gustavus who will introduce the speaker for the evening. Lester Thoreau is a PK, as are John Kendall, Chaplain Elvie, and my wife. <laughs> that is not an honorary society. Lester Thoreau is a preacher's kid, a Methodist preacher's kid. He attended high school in Anaconda, Montana, which experience gave him firsthand knowledge of life in a company town. Now, I'm not sure how that influenced Mr. Thoreau's thinking, but I suspect that the behavior of the Anaconda Copper Company played a role in the making of Mr. Thoreau's mind as an economist. From Montana, he went east to a liberal arts college, to Williams College, from there to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, then to Harvard where he earned his PhD in economics. His alma mater, Williams, was the first of five colleges and universities to award him an honorary degree. Among his many honors, I will mention two because they confirm my judgment of Lester Thoreau's skill as a writer. He received the Gerald Loeb Award for Economic Writing in 1982 and in 1983, prize as the first place columnist awarded by the Champion Media Awards for Economic Understanding. I asked him to talk about how he came to his interest in writing. He said, I had two teachers in high school who encouraged me, and I knew then that I wanted to write well. As an English teacher, I know how satisfying it is to work with students who want to write well and are willing to work at it. Mr. Thoreau works at his writing. He's written at least eight books by himself, co-authored a half dozen more, and has written contributions to some 50 other books. He writes articles for the academic journals in his profession, as well as for such journals as Daedalus, the New England Journal of Medicine, Harper's, 
and the Harvard Education Review. He's also a journalist and columnist, writing for the New York Times, Newsweek, the Wall Street Journal, and several other periodicals. He has worked in a variety of jobs as consultant and advisor to governments and institutions. He has professed economics at Harvard, at the University of Arizona, and at MIT, where he now holds the Gordon Y. Billard Professorship in Economics. Lester Thoreau is something of a media personality. I've watched him on Meet the Press and on the McNeil Era News Hour. He appears on a business news program on PBS television. He shows up regularly on our screens analyzing, commenting, explaining. He, as did John Maynard Keynes, responds quickly and regularly to the passing, changing scene in economics. Now we know that Keynes made a fortune playing the stock market. I don't know if you've made your fortune yet, Lester, I hope so. <laughs> the title of Mr. Thoreau's paper is Constructing a Microeconomics which is consistent with Keynesian macroeconomics. There are about 20 copies of the lecture here and the first 20 of you to come up after the proceedings tonight may have a copy. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your lecture. Mr. Thoreau closes chapter three of his 1984 book called Dangerous Currents with the following. Homo economicus should not, as a rational being, worry about the rate of inflation, whatever it is. Yet, real citizens are worried. Why? The prevailing economic theories have no answer. I look forward to hearing this lecture because I'm worried about the economy, that is the macro economy, and the economy, the micro economy, mine. <laughs> and it would be nice to hear an explanation or two which might ease my worries. Lester Thoreau. What I want to do tonight is go back to the beginning. And I want to take you back to when God and the devil were putting the world together. Uh, and the God created day, and the devil responded by creating night. God created rain and streams and water in Florida. The devil created <laughs> snow, ice, blizzards, glaciers in Minnesota. <laughs> And they went back and forth for a while with God doing something good and the devil doing something bad. And finally, God created an economist. And that kind of rocked the devil back on his heels. And he sat there and he scratched his head. And then his eyes lit up and he created a second economist. <laughs> now, if you remember one thing tonight, you'll be on the right track. And that is, John Maynard Keynes was created by God, <laughs> and his critics were created by the devil. <laughs> now, there is a serious problem, however. And that is, if you went off and read a textbook, as we teach them in Ec 1, there is a fundamental inconsistency. Because if you looked at the microeconomics we teach, and then compared it with the macroeconomics, they are in some very fundamental ways inconsistent. In the microeconomics, there is no such thing as involuntary unemployment because wages fall to make everybody who wishes to work at that wage level employed. Inflation either does not occur or being fully expected does not matter because it doesn't change any of the real variables. And if you look at the rate of growth of the economy, it takes care of itself because it's as high as it can possibly be given all those individual decisions to make saving and work effort and put it into the economy. Now, I think Lord Keynes had an error of omission, and perhaps it's simply because he had pressing problems in the Great Depression and didn't have time to address them. But I think certainly the followers of Lord Keynes, and I would put myself in that category, made a mistake to not think more seriously about how you make a microeconomics that's consistent with the macroeconomics. Now, I agree entirely with the point that Jim Tobin made this morning, that you don't want a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence because that's kind of an empty system. 
But I look around at other things. For example, if you look at wave and particle theory in physics, in some logical level, they shouldn't both have to be employed, but it's often useful to employ both, although on some logical level, they must be inconsistent. Same thing in quantum mechanics. At the level of the atom, micro, it's random behavior. But at the level of the mass, you can tell intelli say intelligent things about what the distribution of atoms is going to do. Now, I think the real problem with microeconomics is not that it's different than macroeconomics. It is that it's fundamentally inconsistent. It, for example, says there can be no such thing as involuntary unemployment, while our macroeconomics starts from the proposition that there is some involuntary unemployment and then attempts to deal with it. And so I don't think we have to build the two on a one-to-one -one correspondence. We can allow for diversity in human behavior, but I think there is a fundamental problem there. Now that's the problem I want to focus on tonight. Now one of the problems we've got in economics, and it was referred to in the introduction, is economics constructs a person which I have called homo economicus, who's a very rational person. The problem is he doesn't have many of the characteristics of actual homo sapiens. For example, homo economicus never has envy. Economists call that interdependent preferences. Uh, he never has envy because if you put envy into the system, you start to get some very peculiar results out of the system, which economists don't like to contemplate. And so by fiat, uh, we get rid of that envy. One of the other stories that's told about economists is two economists on a desert island with no boat needing to get off desperately, and one says to the other, let's assume we have a boat. Uh, well, in this case, we've assumed away something that's important. Now, let's go back to the Great Depression. See, I think we have built up an inconsistency at the moment that didn't exist in the 40s and 50s. Because if you remember our solution to the Great Depression, it really ran on two levels, both on a micro level and a micro macro level. On the macro level, the solution was Keynesian economics where if you have something like the Great Depression, the government should take active steps with either expanding demand, cutting taxes, aggressive monetary policies that are going to raise that level of demand in the Great Depression. But we did something else. We had a whole set of government rules and regulations at the micro level, basically designed to stop the kind of financial collapses we had during the Great Depression. Now, the interesting thing ab about uh, what's going on in economics you heard a lot in the last two days about rational expectations, which is essentially junking macroeconomics and saying that simple microeconomic model is really the true model and there are no macroeconomic models in the system. Now, if you look at the economic literature, what you would have find is that prior to the growth of rational expectations, there was something that happened in microeconomics that I would argue led to rational expectations. And that was the article argument, basically, that all government regulation in the micro market was either worth nothing or perverse and counter. And therefore, that if you just left those microeconomic markets alone in an unregulated fashion, they would perform better than they could possibly perform with any set of microeconomic regulation. Now, if you believe that, which was widely believed in the economics profession, then it's not a very big leap to say, well, in macroeconomics, the rational expectations must be onto something because there are no imperfections down there in that micro model that need to be dealt with with rules and regulations and institutions. For example, take financial deregulation as we're now doing it. Uh, this is an area where I've been involved for a long time because way back in, I think, 1971, there was something called the Hunt Commission, uh, which where I wrote one of the background papers on what you should do about financial deregulation. At that time, I remember writing that some of the regulations that came out of the Great Depression were simply wrong. They were a misdiagnosis of the problem. For example, the sharp break that we have between commercial and investment banking, where commercial banks legally cannot do investment banking. There were other regulations that may have been right or wrong, but with modern technology could not be enforced, like prohibitions on interstate banking. With modern telecommunications, you and I can do a deal in the Bahamas without ever being in the Bahamas, and the idea of stopping me from dealing with a foreign uh, out-of-state bank just isn't there, given modern technology. On the other hand, there's some of those regulations that make sense that are very important to an economy. For example, the idea that everybody ought to have a safe place to pay, put their money where they can get it back, that's called an insured bank account. And at the beginning of the Reagan administration, there were a group of economists who seriously argued that we should get rid of that rule and regulation, insuring bank accounts. 
because the idea was that if a bank had a lot of insured bank accounts, then it would take too risky investments, and what you needed to discipline that bank was a lot of depositors who were afraid that they were about ready to lose their money, and then you would have a disciplined banking system. And that was seriously suggested at the beginning of the Reagan administration, and in fact, it was put into place, briefly, because under American law, everybody up to $100,000 in a bank is insured, but de facto, up until, I guess, 1983, the federal government had insured everybody regardless of how big your deposit was. Because after the Great Depression, they had let no bank go broke in which anybody lost any money no matter how big their deposit was in that bank. Well, then comes the Penn Square collapse, which is a bank that collapses in Oklahoma City. At that point, these same people who want to do away with all insurance of all banking accounts say, well, we can't change the law ex post, but we don't have to insure those people that have more than $100,000 in the Penn Square. And they didn't. And that was the first time since the Great Depression that they had let people lose money as a bank went broke. Now, it had almost immediate consequences. Within two months, the rumor started that the Continental Illinois, the 11th largest bank in America, was going broke started somewhere in the Far East, Hong Kong, Singapore, somewhere. The orders started rolling in, withdrawing money by the billions, and within a day and a half, the Continental Illinois Bank was broke. And it was broke precisely because of what was done at Penn Square. Because if you're a big depositor and you've just learned the lesson, you're gonna lose your money if the bank goes broke, then anytime you hear the rumor that the bank's about to go broke, you wanna get out. And you don't care whether the rumor is true or false, because if you think about what you lose if you stay versus what you lose if you go, all the incentives are going. Well, the, the continent of Illinois had to be nationalized because the only way you could give confidence to those big investors was for the federal government basically to take over the continent of Illinois bank and publicly announce it would guarantee all deposits no matter how large in the continent of Illinois bank. Now that's a case of taking care of institutions. And see, one of the drifts in microeconomics has been this idea that institutions do not need to be taken care of. And that they just kind of automatically bubble up and society has the right institutions that fit it all, on all uh, sides. Now, what I would argue to you that what we need to do to be consistent between micro and macroeconomics is we need the basic proposition that individual free decisions in both the micro and the macro level do not necessarily always lead to the desired results. That's what led to Keynesian economics and macroeconomics, and I would argue exactly the same thing in some circumstances is true in microeconomics. And the second part of that proposition is there is a difference between a society which is simply an aggregation of individuals and something which is a society, which is more important and different from an aggregation of individuals. And so you've got to pay attention to social details as well as individual details. Uh, things don't just help ha happen along to come out right. Now, what that means at the micro level is you have to make room for the argument that there are places where coordination or strategic intervention, and they may be government or some other form of coordination and strategic intervention, makes sense. And so what I plan to do is make an argument that there are places in the microeconomy where the same type of activities that we do in the macroeconomy make sense, and in that sense, the two things are on the same level. We don't have a perfectly functioning microeconomy micro where nothing ever has to be done, uh, just like we don't have a perfectly functioning macroeconomy where nothing ever has to be done. Now, given that this is a Swedish institution and you are all of Viking heritages, I am going to ask you to join with me on a voyage. I want you to strap on your Viking helmets with the horns, do a little boulder lifting to make yourself stronger. Enjoy your mead. And we will row down the fjords of macroeconomics. And we will slash, rape, pillage, burn at least some of the outlying villages of microeconomics. <laughs> and perhaps we will get to the citadel. Now, where I want to do that slashing and burning is basically on a problem that is fundamental to the American problem, uh, economy. It's fundamental to every person in this room. And it is, in fact, the thing that will determine your future standard of living and the future standard of living of your children, just like John Maynard Keynes was addressing a fundamental problem in the 1930s. That is the slowdown in the American rate of growth of productivity. 
If you go back to the period from 1948 to 1965, American productivity grew at 3.3 percent per year. After 1965, there was a gradual slowdown until you get to the seven years between 1978 and 1985, American productivity was growing at 0.8 percent per year. And in 1985, the most recent year, non-farm business productivity only grew at 0.5 percent per year. Now, that is a rate which is one-fourth to one-sixth that of our industrial competitors. German productivity was growing at 3 percent over that period of time. Japanese productivity was growing at 4.5 percent over that period of time. And if you think about the competitive pressures, that period of time was precisely the period of time when American industry was rapidly losing market share to the rest of the world. And if competitive pressures would ever get you to tighten up the ship and raise productivity, that should have been precisely the period of time you saw an acceleration in the American rate of growth of productivity as opposed to a deceleration in the rate of growth of productivity. Now, productivity is essentially what in Keynesian economics is called the aggregate supply function. It's the long run thing that determines our ability to supply goods and services and as Jim Tobin pointed out this morning, it's the long run variable that determines our standard of living. It is absolutely central to economics. Now what I want to argue to you is that at the micro level there are a whole set of things that are going on which would be irrational from the point of view of homo economicus. And the interesting way to see that is if you go off and read the literature written by standard microeconomists on why the rate of growth of productivity has fallen, you will find that they come up and say it is a mystery. We cannot explain it. They say we can't explain it because from the point of view of conventional microeconomics, the thing that determines the rate of growth of productivity is the quality of labor or the quantity or quality of physical capital, natural resources, or technology with which that labor works. And so if you're going to find a decline in the rate of growth of productivity, you have to find some kind of a decline in those quantities and qualities. Either the American workforce is going downhill or we're investing less or we've got lousy technology or something out there has to get worse. Now the interesting thing when people like Kenneth, uh, Dennison and Kendrick do that kind of analysis, they can't find those declines and in fact they often find exactly the reverse. For example, if you take investment in plant and equipment, just to be illustrative, investment in plant and equipment in that period when we had a plus 3 percent rate of growth between 1948 and 1965 was 9.5 percent of the GNP went into plant and equipment investment. In the last seven years when we had a rate of growth of productivity of less than 1 percent, investment went up to 11.6 percent of the GNP. Investment was going up by about a fifth when productivity was being cut by a factor of four. Very hard to explain that decline in productivity based on a decline in investment because in fact there's been an increase in investment, not a decline in investment. And that's why the leading anal analysts of productivity throw up their hands and say mystery. Not too long ago, I was at a meeting where Charles Schultz, who was the economic advisor to uh, President Johnson, said, the more I respect somebody's judgment, the less they know about why productivity has fallen. At the same meeting, Martin Feldstein, who was the economic advisor to President Reagan, said, it can't be true. And if it is true, we can't do anything about it, so I suggest we don't think about it anymore. Because if people are saving and investing less or working less hard and as long as it's freely chosen individual decisions, it's like sex between consenting adults. Who are you to object? <laughs> well, the answer, you, you are to object because if with those individual decisions we produce a low rate of growth of productivity, we produce a non-competitive American economy, and we collectively produce a low American standard of living in the future. And we have every reason to have a social concern in that even if it's produced by perfectly rational individual human choices. Now, what I want to argue to you is that if you look at this problem from a different perspective, and I think it's a perspective that we're going to have to start to bring into economics more than it has been in recent years, this is it not at all a mystery. But it requires you to start with a couple of hypotheses that may sound very sensible to you but are not hypotheses that sound sensible inside the di discipline of economics at the moment. One is the idea that social institutions don't take care of themselves. They require some tender loving care and feeding to make social institutions in anybody's economy work. The second is that managers in the American economy are not simply rational homo economicus. 
They're not simply agents of the capitalists. They are, in Karl Brunner's sense, self-interested, but they are very complicated human beings. Their behavior depend on habits, customs, goals of the firm, and such strange things as role models. Now, the way I want to get into this and try and basically illustrate it is let's start out looking at the productivity problem from a slightly different perspective. Suppose I was to give you a Rorschach test and I simply said the words productivity. What words would you write in your mind? Well, what you would probably write in your mind is that somehow there's something wrong with those lazy, loutish, blue colony assembly line workers who are screwing up and putting Coke bottles and door handles on Friday afternoon. That's the American problem, right? Well, if you look at the data, you have a problem. The problem's very simple. If you take business productivity, as I mentioned, from 1978 to 1985, it was 0.8% per year. Over that seven-year period of time, American private firms permanently fired 1.9 million blue-collar workers, <coughs> which was about 6% of their blue-collar workforce. Over the same period of time, real output after correcting for inflation went up 16%. Now, if you produce 16% more with 6% less, that's a 22% gain in productivity over a seven-year period. And if you do your compounding, that's a 2.9% rate of growth of productivity for blue-collar workers. That's essentially world-class. In some sense, in the American factory, nothing was going wrong. On the other hand, if you look at those same American firms and ask how many white-collar workers were they adding to the system, the answer is they were hiring 10 million white-collar workers, which was a 21% gain in white-collar employment, only a 16% gain in output, and a 5% fall in white-collar productivity. And the fall in white-collar productivity offset a lot of the gain in blue-collar productivity because on American private payrolls at the moment, not counting service workers, we have 58 million white-collar workers and only 30 million blue-collar workers. The average firm has two people in the office for everyone on the factory floor. Now, what we've got now is a system where the American factory works, the American office does not work. But that's a very hard story to start to talk about from the point of view of conventional economics because you've got to start talking about something being wrong with the managers and managers not being 100% efficient. But in conventional microeconomics, you will find that in the textbooks, the word management almost never appears because we assume managers are always the most efficient they can be. And there's lots of evidence that isn't true, empirical evidence, and it's given to us by the Japanese. For example, if you take the famous studies of the escort car and what it costs to produce the escort car in different countries, you will find the Japanese a few years ago could produce it for $2,500 less than the Americans. But if you then said, where did that cost differential come from? 40% of it came from the fact that the Japanese operated with fewer white color overheads than their American car manufacturing competitors. And there have been too many instances in the American economy where Japanese companies have taken over failing American companies and been able to get dramatic increases in productivity partly by getting rid of white collar workers. When Mishihita took over Motorola Quasar, they fired 25% of the white collar workforce and turned out more television sets than Motorola Quasar was turning out. Now that tells you something out there was wrong with American management. And whatever it was that was wrong with American management is wrong right up to this date. Because if you read the business press, you will see a lot of talk about how American firms are getting those white collar overheads under control. If you go off and look at the data, no such thing's happening. In 1985, our most recent year, real output rose by 2.1%. What do you think happened to the number of executives and managers on American payrolls while output was rising 2.1%? They rose 5.6%, almost three times as fast. Now recently, the US Department of Labor has gotten mar modern and junked that Marxist category called blue collar and white collar workforce. They now use the term administrative support staff. <laughs> How much do you think the administrative support staff rose while output was rising 2.1%? The answer is 3.5% or almost twice as fast as output. A lot of talk. And of course, something else is peculiar going on. If you look at investment, almost somewhere around 40% of all the investment in the United States in recent years has gone into office automation. 
Yet there's no evidence that any of that office automation is paying off. The marginal efficiency of capital in Keynesian terms is zero if you look at office automation because we put all this capital in, we get no productivity coming back out of the office. Now, that's the mystery. How would you explain it? What standard microeconomics does, as I've already said, is they throw up their hands and say, mystery. I want to argue it's not a mystery at all. It's only a mystery if you have a very narrow set of hypotheses and set of behavioral characteristics which you are willing to allow into your model. For example, the standard model does not allow the whole concept of power, economic power, does not appear in the model. But we all know that American bosses exist the boss, right? That's what a boss is all about. It says nothing about style. But a good boss, of course, is somebody who should know everything and in principle have the knowledge to make all decisions. It says nothing about institutions. But most little middle-level managers in the United States get paid based on the number of people who report to them. What are you going to do if you get paid based on the number of people who report to you about reducing the number of people who report to you? <laughs> it says nothing about peer pressure. Much harder to fire somebody who works next to you or your own secretary than it is to give an order to fire somebody out there on that factory floor. It says nothing about beliefs. Of course, the common belief is that our system is based solely on individual effort and there's no need to think about group motivation, voluntary cooperation, or teamwork. Now, none of those things appear in microeconomics in what an economist would call the theory of the firm. I would suggest to you all of those things are, in fact, the heart of the theory of the firm. And when we put them back on, we will have a much richer microeconomics, which will give us a much richer macroeconomics. Now, let me say something about heroes and role models. I remember a basketball coach not too long ago saying that if you go back to the 50s and 60s and you think of Bob Cousy, the great Boston Celtic, who could dribble behind his back, and he was the only person in the United States playing basketball who could dribble behind his back. Within five years of seeing that on TV, you started to see it in the high schools. And within 10 years, everybody in the NBA could dribble behind their back. Now, somehow we think that's just standard operating procedure when you talk about people like Kareem Jabbar that make three or four million dollars a year, but it's not standard operating procedure when you talk about other economic activity where people are making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Let me suggest to you that it's exactly the same phenomenon. And part of the American problem is setting up a role model which was inappropriate in some very fundamental ways. If you go back to the late 1960s or the early 1970s and read the business press, you would find a hero that was written about many times. He was a man called Harold Janine, who was head of IT&T. And he was set up in the business press, Forbes, Fortune, Business Week, as the prototypical American manager, and every American manager should try to be just like him, just like my two boys would love to be like Larry Bird. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which business magazine all these come from, but all of these quotes, which I'm now going to read, come from either Business Week, Fortune, or Forbes. Harold Janine, he was the world's greatest manager. It was a manager system of tight control with elements of a spy system. He worked extraordinarily long hours and absorbed thousands of details about IT&T's business. Tales of Janine's incredible stamina at these marathon affairs and of his brutality to any manager who dared to disassemble before him are retold like today's epic poems. Everything the company does is completely numbers oriented. His unique form of management allows him fingertip control over his vast empire. He is an ogre with a business suit, the greatest corporate manager of his time, an unimaginative number scrubber, a great leader of men. That's Harold Janine. And the meeting that was talked about in those quotes was where you would basically bring in the IT&T executives and he would prove to middle-level managers that he knew more facts about what they were doing than they knew about what they were doing. He was the prototypical boss who bossed. He was a macho manager. Now, the problem is that such beliefs usually aren't terribly harmful. When they become terribly harmful is when they are put with a technology when average human beings can carry them out. And what happened in this case is we then invented the office revolution, the computer, telecommunications, and all that. 
And so it became possible in practice, as well as theory, to know all of that information that Mr. Janine supposedly knew. But that required you to build up enormous information bureaucracies. Sending information up the system, information down the system, that was the essence of management. Management by objective, management by the numbers. Let me give you an illustration. In the last seven years, of course, we have done a lot on computerized accounting, right? We've introduced computers into accounting and almost everything. Probably no accounting in America is done by hand anymore. What do you think happened to the number of accountants on American payrolls? Well, back in 1978, there were one million accountants on American payrolls. As I said, we had 16% rate of growth by 1985. How many accountants were on American payrolls in 1985? 1.3 million. A 30% increase in accountants, a 16% increase in output, and an enormous investment in hardware to computerize accounting. Now, why didn't it work? Well, I would argue it didn't work because with that role model in the back of all of our minds, we say, my God, now I can be Harold Janine. I can know all of that information. And so I will ca calculate things every day, which I used to calculate only once every three months. And I will invent management information systems, cost accounting, inventory control, financial accounting, and a dozen, dozen other set of accounts, none of which have much to do with improving output. But the ideal is perfect knowledge. And the institutional arrangement is that the boss who calls for the knowledge, the cost of getting the knowledge is not on his cost center. It's on somebody else's cost center. And the guy who provides the knowledge is not even interested in calculating the cost because the boss has just ordered it up. You don't say to the boss, to hell with that form, it's too expensive. You know anybody in industry who's ever done that and still remained in industry? <laughs> and see, it's exactly like medicine. As was mentioned, I do some writing in medical economics. The medical system is going wild like the white collar system in America is going wild and some of it's the same system. And if one of the things that's happening in that area is it goes back to what's taught in medical school, the role model. The role model is when it comes to stopping giving treatments, do no harm. Give every treatment you can until the side effects of the treatment start to be worse than the disease. That's what an American doctor is taught. Now, as long as the only thing you can do is give people a little opium to make them feel better, no great harm. The problem comes when you get a lot of very expensive technologies. A friend of mine who was a bit of wag in the medical field recently said, everybody in the United States is going to die of a catastrophic illness in the sense that we spend three or four hundred thousand dollars on them, except those people who die quietly in their sleep and we can't get to them. <laughs> <laughs> and depending on whose estimates you take, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of all the money spent on medicine in the United States is spent on people in the year before they die. We put an enormous number of resources into something that has no payoff. Because the stopping rule is put those Herculean efforts in, even there, although there's every reason to believe that those Herculean efforts won't pay off. Because that's the role model and the way it's done. Now, I would argue to you that do no harm and know everything in the business community are essentially equivalent stopping rules. Uh, now, it is true, what we teach in economics, that eventually the efficient will drive the inefficient out of business. First of all, that can take a long time. And secondly, the efficient can be all Japanese and the inefficient can be all American. <laughs> and beliefs about what's the right style change very slowly. Now, one of the things that foreign companies have done to give them better productivity is various forms of participatory management basically where you delegate decisions down the hierarchy rather than making them yourself. And of course the great advantage of that is that you then don't have to have an information system coming back up and down the hierarchy. Uh, participatory management has not been a great success in the United States. And I would argue it is not a great success in the United States precisely because of those role model things that I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, let me read you a set of quotes from the business press about participatory management in the United States. The participatory process does not always fit easily with traditional management methods and measurements. Fearing a loss of power, many middle-level managers torpedoed early participatory programs. The higher up corporate ladder, the higher you went up the corporate ladder, the tougher it seemed to be to shift to the participatory mode. 
Information is power, and it remains a clear badge of rank with managers. Now, participatory management is the idea that you're going to get rid of clear badges of rank, and if you're giving up information, in some sense, you are giving up power. Japanese managers have other systems of rank and power other than making millions of management the decisions. For example, if you take shop floor inventory control at Toyota, which is one of the big competitive advantages in terms of productivity that they have on American firms, some people have looked at that and said, well, that's a, a device for motivating blue collar workers to do better because you let the blue collar workers do inventory control at the end of the day and it gives them a little variety in what they do. If you look at the data, that's not where the productivity is. The productivity is there because then you fire all of the white collar workers who traditionally do man inventory control in American firms. Or the process of participatory management where you let employees directly purchase equipment, sign purchase and sales orders, rather than having industrial engineers who order and purchase equipment. There again, it may be a motivational device, but the real savings is you have much smaller staffs of industrial engineers who spend their time ordering conventional equipment. And let me think about, mention to you something that's interesting here. It's a distinction between what are called locked numerical control machine tools and unlocked numerical control machine tools. In America, most numerical control machine tools are called locked. And by that, you mean that the blue collar worker operating the machine is not allowed to touch the programming. In both Germany and Japan, most numerical control machine tools are what are called unlocked, which means that you teach the blue collar worker to do the programming and let him or her change the program when something seems to be go wrong with the machine. Now, if you look at the analysis, all of the efficiency would be, seem to be on the side of the unlocked numerical control machine tools. Because then when something goes wrong, you don't have to pick up the phone, call somebody, get him there, tell him what's going wrong, wait for him to do it, have two people standing around, and have, then have the machine fixed. But almost all American machines are locked. Why are they locked? Let's look at the words of Iron Age, which is a trade journal dealing with numerical control machine tools. It says, and I quote, workers in their unions have had too much say in manufacturer's destiny. Many metal working executives feel that large, sophisticated, flexible manufacturing systems can help wrest some of the control away from labor and put it back in the hands of where management where it belongs. Well, if the issue is control, then of course a locked machine is better than an unlocked machine because you don't let that bastard on the shop floor have any say about what's going on. But if the issue is efficiency, and in the long run, of course, it's the efficiency that improves your standard of living, not the control, then the Japanese or the German system of unlocked American control machines would seem to, to be the best. Now, let's think of something that strikes a little bit closer to home. Let's take the word processor. Word processors ought to raise productivity, right? You know that there is no scintilla of evidence in the United States that any office automation has ever paid off for any firm. <laughs> and I say that with some confidence. Because in the last six months, I have spoken to the top executives of IBM, Apple, and Wang, and I have challenged them to show me the data that office automation has made their own firms better. <laughs> and they are all incapable of doing it. Yet, as I mentioned, 40% of all the investment is going into this area of office automation. Now, the reason I say word processors are a more sensitive thing, probably most of you in this room are white collar workers. See, two ways to use a word processor. One way to do it is you give it to your secretary and you don't really get much productivity because she spends maybe 20% of her time typing anyway. She's a pretty good typist who didn't make very many errors anyway. And it all gets slightly speeded up, but nothing of very much significance happens. The other way, of course, to use a word processor is to junk the secretary and do it yourself. Anybody with good keyboard skills can talk, can type faster than the world's fastest dictator can dictate. Any American business executive who doesn't have good keyboard skills is in some sense technologically obsolete. <laughs> now, I worked for the New York Times for a year when I was on a sabbatical, and the New York Times is one of the few places I know of where there's only one person in the entire organization that has a private secretary, the chairman of the board. 
And that's partly because people in the newspaper business have always been able to type. But I remember one day being in the business office and there was somebody there doing this kind of typing. And I said to him, what the hell are you doing? And he said, oh, I went to prep school and they told me I'd be so important I'd never have to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> but of course, the secretary is a mark of power, prestige, status. People give up secretaries and do it themselves very reluctantly. Most middle-aged managers don't have good keyboard skills. To get them goes through, means you go through a period of looking clumsy. Human beings don't like to look clumsy in front of their subordinates. They will resist to the nth looking clumsy in front of their subordinates. But you will never find anything about looking clumsy among your subordinates in the traditional theory of the firm. But it may be precisely things like that that stop a word processor from paying off. Now the other problem you've got, of, of course, in this whole business, if you think about reducing white collar overheads, if you fire people like yourself, what is the immediate problem? You may be fired. I will give you an analogy, which Jim Buchanan will say is only true because it's government, but I would argue it is tr it's just as true in private industry as it is in government. And Jim Tobin, who was in the Navy during World War II, will appreciate this. In World War II, there were 12 million troops in the American Armed Forces. Today, there are 2 million troops in the American Armed Forces. What do you think's happened to the number of generals and admirals? <laughs> we have as many generals and admirals today as we did in World War II. And the same thing's true in private industry. Private industry has used none of the modern technology to reduce the number of generals and admirals. Because what admiral is going to fire an admiral? If you fire admirals, then you have less opportunity for promotion because if you fire people below you, you know the people above you are going to fire down too. Uh, in a world of some of our competitors where salaries are less dependent on position and more dependent on seniority and some other variables, people are less reluctant uh, to make some of those changes because it doesn't impinge so directly on their own personal economic circumstances. If you get redeployed, it won't mean a 50% cut in income, which it'll typically mean in the United States. I was at the management institute of a big company, which I guess will have to remain nameless, uh, where I had 30 division managers in the room. And we were talking about their economic problems. And it came that in this big company that went all the way from mining to electronics, and that'll probably tell you the name of the company, <laughs> uh, that the rate of return, the, the payout period was 2.8 years. Every project in that company was supposed to pay for itself in 2.8 years. And I said to these people, how many people in the room think that's the right payback period? Not a single hand went up. How many people are going to go back to the division you're managing and change your payback period? Not a single hand went up. Because, of course, they were going to be judged and promoted and paid based on meeting that 2.8 payback period. Now that, that's irrational. Not supposed to happen in microeconomics. But the real microeconomic world out there, the world of homo sapiens rather than homo economicus, is, I would argue is full of those kind of things that basically have to be bought, brought into the economic analysis. Take the choice that American firms often face between investing in R&D and building up new industries, which of course is a way to make the economy bigger, and simply having a merger or a takeover, which is the way to make the company bigger, but not necessarily the way to make the economy bigger. One of the problems you have is if you've got yourself into an environment where everybody is self-interested and defensive, it can be very difficult to make the kind of changes necessary to set up a new activity in your company, and at least in theory, it is much easier to have a takeover. Now, not too long ago, I was a down at Tulane University, and the students at Tulane were running a week seminar which had kind of an interesting theme. It was called Heroes. And every night, they had a different type of hero. Uh, and then they had somebody to be a social commentator on those heroes. I was asked to be the social commentator on economic heroes. What do you think the economic heroes were that those Tulane students picked? They got to pick three actual human beings who were their economic heroes. Well, the three people they picked were the guy from Drexel Burnham who invented junk bonds, 
Irv Jacobs, who's kind of a minor league boom pickens, takeover artist, <laughs> and a black woman who runs an advertising firm in Chicago and was brought by Ronald Reagan to his State of the Union message and pointed to as a hero. Now think of that. The heroes are advertising, junk bonds, and takeovers. Not one of those things will make the GNP one iota bigger. I pointed that out during my social commentary, but during the question periods from the students, there was not a single question about the substance of the activity. Every question from the students was, how can I be like you and make a lot of money? And of course, they were making a lot of money, but they were not contributing to the GNP. Uh, and that kind of boom pickings mentality, that's the way to get rich. Of course, that is true microeconomics. That is the way to get rich. But that's not the way for society to get rich. And it's those kinds of social organizational details that you have to have some way of controlling. For example, take United States Steel. Suppose we lived in an institutional world where it could not have bailed out of steel by buying marathon oil. Do you think its current steel facilities would be better or worse run than they're run today? We know the answer to that question. They would be better run because if the choice of the top management was make those damn steel facilities work or lose your own job, they would make the steel facilities work better. If the choice is, hey, I can get out of this messy situation and fire all the employees and everybody else, that's precisely the step you will take. I see that very dramatically in my hometown because, as was mentioned, I grew up in an Anaconda, Montana, which, when I went to high school and worked underground four summers, had 20,000 people working underground in the mines and mills of Butte and Anaconda. Today, the number is zero, 100 percent shut down, like northern Minnesota. The interesting thing about American copper companies is every copper company where the copper was just a subsidiary of a bigger conglomerate shut their mines down. Every copper company where they did nothing but copper is still operating. Because if you did nothing but copper and shut your mind down, you had to fire yourself. And very few presidents fire themselves. And those companies that had no choice found a way to cut the costs and managed to survive even with 50 cent a pound copper, while the Anaconda, which was part of Arco, big oil company, was shut down with not a much of a backward look because from that point of view, hey, it's a big tax write-off. We'll just take right off the loss and it's not uh, much. It was a too easy route. Now, see, what I want to argue to you is that standard operating procedures have a very strong hold on the mind. And when we think about those kind of things, we've got to bring that into economics. Let me tell you one other thing that I think points out the same kind of a problem. Not too long ago, somebody from Wang f noticed that they had facilities in Taiwan which were producing exactly the same th things as facilities in Boston. And even after you corrected for wages, the costs per unit were half as much in Taiwan as they were in the United States. And as any sensible executive would, they say, that's an interesting phenomenon. We better find out why that's going on. It clearly doesn't have anything to do with wages. We've already corrected for that. He said that when you got there, you found thousands of little details different no one of which explained the difference, but in some total explained the difference. For example, it is standard American operating procedure that every white collar worker gets a telephone on their desk. Blue collar workers in America don't get a telephone on their desk. Most white collar workers have very few business phone calls they have to make every day. He said no one phone's terribly expensive, maybe $30 a month, but you multiply by that by thousands of white collar workers and pretty soon you're talking about real bucks. But of course, taking telephones away from white collar workers, my God, that would cause a revolution. Because by right, American white collar workers get a telephone on the desk. That's the way it's always been. Well, it isn't the way it's always been, but we think it's always been that way. But it's those kind of things that the competitive forces are going to require a change in American behavior. But it's also those kind of things, I would argue, that you have to basically build into your macroeconomics. Now. What this means, of course, is if you have the traditional blinders, there are a whole set of things which various economists have suggested for raising productivity. Some of them may work, they may not work. But from the conventional point of view, you can say, I know that's wrong. Not because I've done any empirical investigation, but simply because it must be wrong because it contradicts my theory or initial hypotheses. For example, there is a, an American economist by the name of Martin Weitzman 
who's argued that the bonus system could do certain things to improve our performance, both in terms of macroeconomic activity, uh, in, in the sense of having less inflation, and in terms of microeconomic activity, in the sense of having more productivity. But there are many American economists, and I've heard him do it, who stand up and say, that's nonsense. I know that's false. Because you're telling me how people are paid, whether they're paid once a week or once a month or once every six months with a bonus, makes the difference to what they do. And I know that isn't true. Because rational homo economicus works because he's paid a marginal product, and how the check comes, weekly, monthly, or in a bonus, makes no difference to how hard homo economicus works. Therefore, that's nonsense. Other, other people have suggested uh, that maybe we should shift from profit maximization to something the Japanese call value-added maximization, where you basically treat the firm more like a partnership, where you're maximizing the value-added of the partners, and then you're worried about how you distribute it among the partners. Same thing there. And the idea is that you give people job security, and with job security, then they're willing to accept some of those technical changes in redeployment deployment, that they would not be willing to accept in the conventional system. Standard economist says, that's nonsense. I know that's nonsense. Because the way you get productivity is hard-nosed, fire him when he isn't needed. And what the way you get productivity is any time a worker isn't needed, you fire him. That pushes him off in the general labor, labor pool where he can re be redeployed to the most efficient part. And any time a worker gets one nickel more, he quits. Because that's income maximization, and by moving to a job that pays one nickel more, you're raising your marginal product, and that leads to efficiency. Now, of course, the problem is that it also may lead to an environment where everybody's very resistant to technology. Because if a new piece of technology comes in, you get fired. Now, in the standard model, you're not worried about being fired. Because you just go out there in the labor market, and if you want a job, you walk up to the factory gate and you offer to, work, offer to work for one penny less than the guy there is working, and they take you on. Now, I don't know anybody, economist or anybody else, who's ever actually done that. Walk up to the factory gate, knock, and say, whatever your wage is, I'll work for a nickel an hour less. And I suspect economists would be scandalized if somebody came to MIT and did that to me, <laughs> or came to UCLA and did it to Professor Leuvenhoven. Uh, take the fast track. In business schools, what is basically taught, not by the faculty, but by students one to another, is the way to succeed is to get on the fast track. And what you do is you go to work for a business firm and you try and have some dramatic success which calls attention to you so that people see you as a comer. And if you don't find an opportunity to do that within two years, you quit and go to a different corporation and look for another opportunity. And for example, if you look at Harvard Business School graduates, something like 80% of them have changed jobs within two years of graduating from the Harvard Business School. Now, there's a problem with the fast track. The problem with the fast track is it says if you maximize the opportunities for these comers, that's going to be a real incentive for them to get out and work. But what, is, of course, is going to happen to the 99% of the population who don't make it on the fast track? If he's so good, let the bastard solve the problem. And you've got tremendous mismotivation among everybody else. Now, the interesting thing in the United States is we stop, start the fast track in the late 20s. The Japanese start the fast track in the mid-40s. And for a 20-year period of time, they basically force everybody to march along more or less in a cohort without making these distinctions as to who's on the fast track or not on the fast track. They rotate jobs, they more or less all get the same wage rate, regardless of whether they're the best in the group or the worst in the group. Now, from a conventional point of view, that's inefficient, because you're not sorting people out based on their marginal productivity. The problem is, if you look at the data, it may be the essence of efficient, because those companies that are doing those inefficient things are getting more efficiency out of the system than the American companies who are supposedly doing the things that are efficient relative to those microeconomic models. Now, those are the kind of things you have to, have to think about in this area. Now, my final comment is, if you, I think if we built up a rich microeconomics based on homo sapiens, then we wouldn't really have the problem with all of these perfect markets that are supposed to instantly clear, and they wouldn't be not clearing because of market imperfections. See, economics on one level is very peculiar. 
Suppose an astronomer saw a planet in the wrong spot that made his theory wrong. What would he say? Well, he'd say, I've got to go back to the drawing boards and make my theory right. What does an economist do when he sees a planet in the wrong spot? He says, market imperfection, get rid of it. <laughs> Change the data to make my theory right. Now, see, in, in some senses, as I do, I teach part-time in a business school and part-time in the economics department, I see that. One of the things that business schools exist to do is to force homo sapiens into being closer to homo economicus. And I think oftentimes that's not a smart way to move. Now, for both economists and managers, it's important to understand that you can have blinders that leads to low productivity. What I've argued tonight is that managers in America have a set of blinders that have led to low productivity. But of course, I'm also saying something else. I'm saying the economics profession that is in love with precisely that micro microeconomics which I've been describing also has blinders which leads to a low set of productivity. Because it leads them to a theory about microeconomics which is not consistent with reality, not consistent with macroeconomics. And so if you come to the bottom line, my reading is that the real analytical defects are not to be found in Keynesian economics, although that's not perfect. The real an un analytical defects are to be found in this kind of uncontested microeconomic model that has this all-knowing, perfectly rational, free market behavior by that great animal, homo economicus. Thank you. Thank you. We started out for this conference uh, two years ago. Uh, the, a group of joyful economists in this college, McCrasty and Anderson and Bungham and Reese, and our leader was Anderson. He was not permitted to come this all the way, the journey to the, the conference. And so we have carried out these, this conference these last two days as a memorial to him. His dear friend, Dr. Brunner, came from Switzerland to pay to him an unforgettable tribute yesterday, which he followed with a classic speech without a note it will surely stand as a classic in the book when we see it next year. Andy's sword was passed on to Dr. David Reese, who came to this college eight years ago, for whom I've had great admiration since he came. My admiration has increased. He has artic he understands our topic, he has articulated it for us, he has carried us along. In the literature for the conference, we said this in many ways, this is Lionel's conference. Uh, from behind the scenes, I also know that this is very much uh, Dr. David Reese's conference. Before you leave tonight, I would like to have him introduce very briefly our panelists who are with us for these two days and have you meet them, please. Dr. David Reese, chairman of Nobel 22. Thank you very much. The hour grows late and our conference draws to a conclusion. There are numerous thanks I could give to the help and support I've gotten. I will forego naming persons by name. They will forgive me for that, I am sure. But I am deeply appreciative for all the help that we've received from the staff, from the student hosts, from the faculty hosts, and from the many people who have made this conference possible. I know that some of you have not uh, been with us throughout the entire conference. And so to close the conference, I will call on 
each member of the Nobel panel and give them a brief opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you. Uh, they may respond uh, in some way to Professor Thoreau's comments or to other members of the panel who have made er er other comments or may uh, greet you and speak to you in whatever manner they wish to do so. Uh, I'll begin uh, on my right. May I call on uh, Baron Stigrommel. Uh, that was not fair to let me <laughs> to shoot the fo first shot. I think uh, I have had already uh, so many op opportunities to um, say farewell. I think we got uh, one the afternoon. But uh, I'm glad to have uh, this last opportunity to say what a marvelous experience it has been to be here at Gustavus Adolphus. Um, with this brilliant performance, we heard from uh, Les Toro, I think it was really the right way to end it, end it. The only thing I can say to Les Toro that uh, um, <coughs> all the problems uh, you have here in America apparently are staggering. Uh, you are welcome to Sweden, we have sold them all. <laughs> Uh, we had uh, we had uh, an army of uh, of um, uh, thirty thousand uh, men when we uh, with Gustavus Adolphus as a general conquered uh, fifty percent of Europe. Uh, now we have uh, an army of uh, of a uh, hundred thousand. And uh, we have not yet done anything uh, seriously, <laughs> uh, but uh, we don't know. <laughs> uh, let me uh, say that I arrived uh, to this conference. Uh, I was I have uh, two heroes uh, in my life, uh, and um, besides Alfred Nobel, of course, and one is uh, Thomas Jefferson. And the other one is John Maynard Keynes. And I was a little afraid coming here that um, uh, my picture of him would be destroyed uh, because uh, <coughs> he has a lot of men enemies, even if I have not met him here uh, at Gustavus Adolphus. But I come, will leave this conference uh, with a, a better picture of, of Keynes, what he has done and what he m means today uh, and uh, what he will mean in the f in for the future. And I think that is a fine thing to have happened at this small conference of two days with but uh, a small conference but with great participants. Thank you so much. If I may now call on our Nobel laureate and recent recipient of the Doctor of Humane Letters Honorary Degree from Gustavus, Professor James Tobin. Well, thank you very much. It, I certainly have been uh, greatly impressed by the uh, hospitality of Gustavus Adolphus and the uh, efficiency and smoothness of the arrangements for this uh, rather uh, ambitious uh, conference. And I congratulate President Kendall, David Reese, and all the student hosts, particularly my own, Greg, and uh, faculty host, Bungum, and all of you, and Elaine Brostrom, for, um, for doing all this so well. Uh, it's a very uh, ambitious uh, enterprise for this college to undertake. It gives a difficult assignment to um, bring technical matters uh, from some science or even non-science uh, like ours into uh, uh, before uh, a large audience of uh, varied uh, interests and varied uh, experience with the uh, subject matter. And I can only hope that um, 
our presentations uh, uh, didn't leave you too confused about, about the uh, subject and may excite your interest in uh, macroeconomics and in the uh, missing foundations uh, for macroeconomics that we heard about tonight. Now, <clears throat> Gilbert and Sullivan wrote uh, an operetta called HMS Pinafore, and in that story, as uh, some of you may remember, there's a, a lowly economist named Ralph Rackstraw, who is working in the, uh, probably with a word processor or <laughs> computer, in the bowels of the Federal Reserve System, and uh, had the temerity to uh, try to run off with the chairman's daughter. And he was caught of course, and uh, he was asked what he had to, said for, to say for himself. And he said, I am a Keynesian. <laughs> and so then the uh, chorus of, uh, of uh, all the uh, crew of the uh, good ship uh, Federal Reserve or HMS Pinafore, as the case may be, uh, sang this rousing song, which I can't sing, so I just have to give you the words. So he is a, a Keynesian, for he himself has said it, and it's greatly to his credit that he is a Keynesian. For he might have been Valrasian, supply side, or Lucasian, or perhaps Freedmaniac. But in spite of all temptations, of the rational expectations, he remains a Keynesian. <laughs> he remains a Keynesian. The Reverend Canon Ronald Hayden Preston. Well, as I said this afternoon, I'm the odd man out in this company as an amateur among the professionals. I have a great admiration for John Maynard Keynes. He took ethics very seriously. He never succeeded in integrating his different pictures of humanity into his uh, finally formulated thought and our pictures of humanity and human beings and how they operate and how they might and ought to operate are quite fundamental and they certainly underlay a lot of the exceedingly interesting reflections we heard from um, pr um, Professor Thoreau this evening. I am by profession a, what I suppose is called a moral theologian but it is impossible for a moral theologian to sit in his study and cogitate by himself a whole series of either analyses or recommendations about human behavior. He simply has to get into the thick of it with others. And this li makes life very strenuous. It forces people like me uh, to have to try and keep up with and make some contribution to people in different fields. And unfortunately, one can't be a specialist in all of them either, but one still has to try and cope. And economics is only one of them, but is one among others, but one that I have had to try and cope with. I think economics is a very difficult discipline. I quoted this afternoon to someone the saying that the job of an economist is like someone trying to lay, like a hen, trying to lay an egg on a moving staircase. <laughs> and I think if you um, think that out, you can see the essence of his problem, which is <laughs> a, a very real one. So I have been very grateful for having to face up to this challenge. It's caused me a good deal of <clears throat> hard work and anxiety in advance. But the uh, conference itself has proved well worth it, and I feel honored and grateful for the invitation. And I must say, I'd word of appreciation for the extremely kind and efficient way 
in which I have been looked after, uh, and I know the rest of us as visitors here have been too. Uh, we've heard just a moment ago from Professor Thoreau. I'd be very pleased for him to uh, give any comments if he cares to, although I'll also excuse him if he would prefer. Thank you. Uh, Professor Axel Leinhoven. Well, as uh, the evening goes on, uh, there's one act after another that is harder and harder to follow. <laughs> um, I think it's in a sense unfair to Les Thoreau not to discuss his paper, but I think it would, because there's a lot of things I would like to discuss, and I was greatly stimulated by it, and I liked it. Uh, I also think it would be unfair to all of you if I diluted <laughs> uh, his splendid presentation by starting something at this hour. Um, <laughs> so let me uh, just say my thanks to my host. Uh, it has been uh, a great experience for me uh, to be here and uh, get startled all o over and over again uh, hearing my name pronounced right. <laughs> uh, it's very invigorating for me, I must say. Uh, more seriously, uh, I came partly uh, out of curiosity. Uh, I uh, have lived in this country now for 26 years and uh, I had not yet uh, visited uh, a Swedish college with Lutheran traditions or Lutheran college with Swedish traditions. Uh, and uh, I'm very much impressed uh, by Gustavus, not just by the, the uh, facilities, and not just by the hospitality, which has been fantastic, and I thank Byron and Craig in particular, uh, but I've had the opportunity to speak with, I don't know, 12, 15, or 20 Gustavus students, and I've been very impressed with, uh, with the morale of the place. Uh, uh, the students are impressive. Uh, they, they like their college, they would obviously uh, try to convince anybody else to come here too. And uh, that kind of morale is, um, you don't find very often. And I think that's the most impressive thing about Gustavus. And I congratulate uh, the president and the faculty of this place for um, that accomplishment. Thank you very much. Professor Jeffrey Harcourt. My mother always taught me to say thank you for people for having me, and so I say thank you very much for having me. I'd like especially to thank uh, um, uh, Bill and Joel, who've looked after Joan and myself magnificently, and uh, it's been a great pleasure to meet them both. I hope one uh, gets his blue for gridiron, becomes a great accountant, and I hope the other one has his books properly appreciated because I'm sure they're very good books. I've always described myself uh, as an Australian patriot and a Cambridge economist. And one of the reasons why I decided to spend the second half of my life working in Cambridge, apart from the fact I was too old to play Australian rules, was because I wanted to uh, do something to preserve the tradition which was associated with Keynes and Cambridge and supported by the great love of my wife, Joan, and my children, I've been privileged to be allowed to do that, and I've been privileged by your invitation to come here and try and explain uh, why I think that's an important thing to do. So I thank you for allowing me to have that opportunity, and I thank you very much for your hospitality. I'm very relieved that the American economy, anyway, has such uh, astute and acute minds examining it as the uh, American economists on the uh, panel that I've heard. And of course, I include in the, the American economists, uh, since it's not a homogeneous group, uh, Axel and uh, Carl Brunner, who I've been delighted to meet, 
uh, as well as the homegrown varieties, uh, some of whom I've known, some of whom I'm glad to have the opportunity to meet, and all of whom I've greatly admired. Let me tell you one story which I think illustrates some of the themes uh, uh, which um, uh, we, we've dealt with. Um, Mitterrand, Gorbachev and Mrs Thatcher were discussing the nationality of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And Mitterrand said, they must be French, they live on love and apples. <laughs> and Gorbachev said, Nit. there is cooperation, there is no competition, they are Russian. And Mrs. Thatcher said, belt up you two, they have nothing to eat, they have no clothes, and they have no houses to live in, and they think they're in paradise. They're obviously British. <laughs> Professor James M. Buchanan. Well, I can't follow that one. <laughs> but first of all, I would like to extend my apologies to Jeffrey Harcourt because I accused him this afternoon of introducing irrelevant material. But after Les Thoreau to give that talk about the legacy of Keynes, I surely assure uh, old Jeffrey Harcourt a major <laughs> apology. <laughs> uh, uh, apparently, there's a sort of a silent conspiracy that we don't talk uh, about what Les Thoreau said. Uh, there's a lot of things I could say about what he said, uh, but I think I will say a little bit about what he didn't say. Now, underneath uh, his criticism here, underneath it all, somehow was something he didn't say was the sort of sort of uh, implicit, uh, silent notion that somehow if we just had the government to take care of things and correct all these things, intervene all over the place, that things would be better. But let me assure you, living in the Washington Beltway and seeing those goddamn bureaucrats <laughs> every day. Now, if it would be, be different if we're out here. Out here, I feel every time I come to the great Midwest, and this, certainly this has been reinforced in spades in this particular uh, occasion. Uh, there's something solid about, about the whole setting and the whole culture. It's a culture that I admire tremendously. Uh, it, it extends all over the great Midwest. But I assure you that the climate around Washington is quite different. And let me, uh, let me agree to some extent with every criticism that Les Thoreau has made about the inefficiency in American industry. But let me warn you, it would be quite different in turning something over to some people from out here and turning it over to the Washington bureaucrats. Thank you very much. We'll pass the microphone for Professor Carl Brunner. Uh, Professor Thero gave us a superb performance of uh, entertainment. And uh, <laughs> as to the rest, I mean, I'm not quite sure. I agree that it is really a pity that we have no opportunity to discuss in detail some of the substance of what has been said, to which Jim Buchanan uh, uh, indicated. Now, let me first, however, indicate the following. I enjoyed this conference very much. I wasn't quite sure how it would be and how it would go. But I found it superbly organized, a very friendly atmosphere indeed, in every respect, particularly for me who have a bit uh, some minor structural flaws in some <laughs> respects. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed very much to listen to some of the papers. Some of the papers were more attuned to my interest and work, like uh, Reverend Preston and uh, some of the others, and I was, uh, I was very interested also to listen to Jeffrey Harcourt, which I met to the first time, and I knew about his work, and that followed his work, and so it was, gave me an opportunity to round up my uh, horizon a bit in this respect, and I found this very, very useful. I also was very intrigued to visit the Gustavus Adolphus College. Uh, the reason simply is that, uh, well, say uh, shortly after Caesar conquered Gaul, I was a young man and uh, 
uh, that uh, I was very intrigued when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And Gross was one of my hobbies in the history of the 30-year war in Germany. And I read diligently, and uh, Gustavus Adolphus was my great hero. Well, uh, I read Friedrich Schiller's history several times again, but every time when I came to the passage, uh, the battle in southern Germany where he was killed, I skipped reading the battle. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. I thought history should be rewritten, uh, you know. <laughs> well, but then the conference theme was not Gustavus Adolphus. The conference theme was the legacy of Keynes. And uh, indeed, it was highly appropriate for the college to organize something like this 50 years after the general theory was published. The legacy is still alive, indeed. After all, we are testimony of it. We were discussing the whole issue. And whether you discuss it critically or approvingly, there is this legacy, which we have to contend with. A variety of wide range of problems serious problems which we are confronting still today in our society on the aggregate level or on the level of allocation and use of our resources domestically, internationally, on a variety and a wide range of these issues. I mean the Keynesian legacy or the legacy of Keynes, which it would more properly say, however it was transmitted and transmuted in many different ways, is of relevance for us to contend with. Now, my specific interest and theme in this context at this time was associated with problems which are, I think, very much in the forefront of our discussions, namely with issues of what is a moral order and uh, how do we achieve and maintain a moral order and what does Keynes to contribute in this respect. And there, for instance, the, we have very serious problems to contend with. Because one of the easy answers seems to be, well, and there has been a certain tradition in various branches. Well, man is immoral, so let's make him moral by just imposing a moral society on him. But the basic point which I want to make is that we have to be very, very attentive to what this means in the institutional arrangements, because institutional arrangements, however the motivation, however the best design which we have in our mind, have their own momentum and their specific consequences and incentives to which people respond and which shapes their behavior. And the result may very well be then that we have an immoral society imposed on ambivalently moral or ambivalently immoral man, which is a very strange animal indeed, this man, or a very strange being in many, many ways, a fascinating being, being I always found throughout my life, with his potential, a potential ranging from people, from Stalin and Hitler on the one side, which each one murdered, directly or indirectly, millions and millions of people until Francisco of Assisi, El Poverino. What a span. Well, we have to take account of that. And so the point is, I repeat what I said at the conference, I think just from the point of view, if we are concerned for a moral order, then one of our basic questions we should ponder and very carefully assess is, do we fit the man to the institutions or the institutions to the man? Well, that's not a good way of putting it, as I indicated. The issue is, do we accept the ambivalent basic nature of man? with all its potentials, and design institutions which try to channel and give incentives to channel these efforts in the average, in directions of which the community can benefit? Or do we try to shape institutions which are designed or hopefully attempt to shape and change its basic nature? Well, I maintain that if we do the latter, we will result in a disaster, just from a moral point of view. Now, that remains to be seen. I think some of you who are young enough may have an opportunity to check the evidence. Probably you can give me some signals then. Perhaps I can learn indirectly. Thank you.
This concludes our program tonight and our conference. Good evening. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll be back in one sec. I just want to see.
Yeah. Anyway, good luck with that next book. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>